Let's pray together. Father, all power belongs to You. You have created everything visible and invisible through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We would like to worship You at this time. Give us the strength, the insight, and the power to do so. For You are worth our time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Let's have a youth message. get tight, I'm sure it's a matter of the ozone layer that's <laughs> making my, my pants shrink. Yeah, my dad made me put on a shirt that it was even tighter, so I took yeah. that off and you didn't realize it was covering up. <laughs> I tell you, that's a part of growth, I guess. Yeah. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. All right? When Bilbo Baggins, that's a character, in, a fictional character in a story, was talking to Gollum, who's the bad guy, he was giving him a riddle about what has no door, no lock, no key, yet golden treasure inside is hid. And the answer was an egg. And here we have an egg. Anybody eat an egg this morning for breakfast? No. Okay, I didn't eat it. Just some toast. <laughs> just toast? Okay. All right, what do we know about this egg? Um, it's oval and it has some sort of chick inside of it. Good. But there's, but there's also a yolk. Uh huh. Um, but it gets refrigerated so it's not fertile. It's not a fertile it's, egg. It's not a fertile egg. There's been no rooster around. So, and we think it is a chicken egg. There are lots of eggs, different sizes and different colors. What kind of colors of eggs do you know about? Uh, there's white, blue, blue, uh, for birds. But also, there's this one time where my mom was boiling some eggs, and then we heard this <laughs> sound. My, my, my dad, I'm like, are, are, are chickens crying in there? So my mom takes it off and just realizes it's probably just like the air inside of it. That might be. I hope it was just escaping air. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Once an egg is fertilized, a Can't chick starts to grow. How does it breathe? Yeah. It doesn't have nowhere to breathe, so. It no, can't. it doesn't. How can it breathe? Maybe there's like this teeny tiny little hole it can breathe through, but no yolk can get through it. Okay, that's a good thought. I always, I've, I've always wondered how chickens breathe and send the eggs. Yeah. But yeah. I'm thinking, since like, how do babies breathe inside mommy's tummies? Well, they're attached to mom with an umbilical cord. Yeah. And the oxygen in her blood goes down and feeds the baby. It doesn't need to breathe until it comes out. Yeah. Yeah. So, no umbilical cord. Yeah, How does it, it breathe? It does have an umbilical cord. No. What? The egg? I'm talking about egg now. Oh. Babies have umbilical cord, yes. But not an egg. There are holes in this shell so that the baby chick can breathe. But there, how, how, did, how come the yolk doesn't escape? Good question. There's a membrane inside of here that keeps it from leaking out. And the holes are so small, it can't leak out. So is it just one big hole? <laughs> no, there's no one big hole here, is there? No, but if you take a magnet flying glasses, Yes, you'd have to take a magnifying glass or maybe a microscope to look into it. Just put it up in the sky and look at it. 
close Guess how many holes are in this eggshell? Five billion. Five million. That's a large number. Five billion. Five billion. That's a larger number. One. Ten thousand. Ten thousand? There are ten thousand holes in every egg. What if there's one extra? Oh! How dare you? You just made 1,001. Yeah, I did. 10,001. Okay, I broke it. And we're going to see there are certain things in this egg. There's, there's clear stuff. You're spilling the there's yolk. There's yolk. I know how to separate the yolk. And I'll eat this later. Notice inside this egg, there's a little pocket in there. That's a pocket of air. Then when the chick gets large enough, it will use this air to breathe. And then when it gets to full size, that's not enough air for it. It's got a little bump on its beak, and it starts to peck away inside that egg. Cracking until it, with it the opens tent, it up. Well, it would hurt the, it would hurt his head if he just had a beak in the head. But he has a, and this is what you would call engineering. An engineer is someone who solves problems. Uh, a mechanical engineer takes different uh, machinery one and figures out how to make things work if there's a problem, well how to readjust it. Uh, an engineer who figures out how to lay out a whole area of houses for people has to figure out how the water can come in and the sewage can go out and the electricity, that, that's what an engineer does. He solves problems. Some solve water problems. Some solve hydrological problems. Some solve uh, heating and air conditioning problems. And this is a problem that has to be solved by the engineer. Because, first of all, you got to get air into that chick. Well, that's solved by 10,000 holes in this egg so that air can get in and it can breathe. What, can you just... But after it gets bigger, it needs more air than those holes can give him. So there's a little air pocket that he can tap into. But then, when he gets even bigger than that, that air is gone. He's used it all. And so the engineer, God, put a little bump on his beak so that he can tap, 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 tap. Does that, stay, does that stay there for It falls off after it gets out of the egg. Once he hits the air and it dries out, it'll fall off. But God, the great engineer, who figured out all the problems there would be and how to handle them, he figured out how to make an egg. Only God can make an egg. There's all kinds of eggs. There's, There's all kinds of interesting things that happens with eggs. Yeah, I keep finding like a few months ago I found two eggs that fallen out of their nests. One blue with white dots and one white one that I thought was still full and fertile. But no, it was cracked. So. Yeah. Usually the blue eggs are robin eggs. Yeah, there's yeah. all different colors of eggs. Okay, now, if God could figure out how to engineer an egg so that people or animals, different kinds of birds and all, could live, could be born, he could also figure out our problems and how to solve them. We'll see more about this egg. Um, um. And when I was in daycare, I think God told my dad to um, take me out of daycare because I was being bullied all the time. Well, that's what dads are for, to protect us. You bet. Absolutely. And that's what God does. He solves our, our problems. One father. He protects He's our biggest father in the world. That's right. Okay, ready? John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for how, how smart you are.
you're a genius. You figure out how to give birth to all things and how to create things and solve the biggest problems that we have. And Father, help us to trust you that you can take care of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And without Bible teaching in the soul, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that God exists as a rewarder, and He becomes a rewarder for those who seek Him. Let's seek the Lord in Psalm 32. Psalm 32. I'll just start off with a couple passages here. Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Let's prepare ourselves for taking in God's word with silent prayer. Let's pray together. <coughs> now, Father, teach us the truths, the principles from your word, so that we'll know how to stand and solve the problems we find in life. You're the greatest resource we have, and we'd like to learn from you. May your spirit do its work in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 32 is about David confessing his sin of uh, the Bathsheba incident. So let's see the background very briefly. In 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. David, the king of Israel, the ultimate authority of the land, commits grievous sins against God. Chapter 11, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites, besieged Rabbah capital, but David remained in Jerusalem. Probably not the geographical will for David. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. To summarize this, so David sends word to Joab 
to send for Uriah to come home so he can ask him questions as to how the battle's going and whatnot. That wasn't what David wanted. He figured he'd go home and, and having sex with his wife, uh, he would think the child was his. That way he could cover it over. But Uriah was more noble than David, and he refused to go home. And when David questioned him about it, he said, the army of the Lord is in the battlefield. I'm not going to go home while the army's in the battlefield. He was a good soldier, a good man. He was not a Jewish man. He was a Gentile who served in the Jewish army as a believer. This is a fellow that David should have seen in Uriah. I want to be like this man, like I used to be before my sin. And after he, he could not get him to go home and tried several ways, he finally sent him back to the army with a message for Joab, the commander of the army. And the message was, send Uriah into the heat of the battle and withdraw the flanks. That meant he would be killed. And that's exactly what happened. Now, for Joab to have such a pathetic attack such as this that risked men's lives and many of them died he should be demoted he should have his position taken from him but he sent a message to david well you know we got too close to city walls and the flanks attacked us and and we were defeated and had to retreat and uriah your servant is dead made sure he said that after the wife of Uriah Bathsheba. She mourns for her husband for a period of time, and then David takes her and marries her. He doesn't confess this sin to the Lord. He doesn't ask for the Lord's help in this weakness of it. He's got six wives for pity's sake. But he keeps it a secret what we would call a hidden sin. David is at fault here, not Bathsheba. I want to make that clear. When David called for Bathsheba, she had no choice. He was the king of the land. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters? Yeah. Yeah. Who are you going to call? Going to call the Supreme Court of the land? He was the Supreme Court of the land. Going to call the police force? He was the police force. Going to call for the authority that would take care of this problem? He was the authority. She had no choice. This was rape. And she bears the child. An unnamed child. And it gets sick. And it dies. David mourns for the child petitioning, asking God to spare the child's life, but it wasn't God's will. And the child dies. David gets up, he washes himself, he, he eats some stuff, and people ask, oh, why, why are you not mourning now that the child's dead? He said, when it was alive, I thought, well, maybe God will show me mercy. But once it was dead... I can go to him, but he can't come back to me. What a great passage that is about what happens to our little ones who die before a time of accountability. Let's take a look at chapter 12 because Nathan, who is the pastor, the uh, chaplain, we would say, of David, the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said, there were two men in a certain town. One was rich and the other was poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one ewe, little ewe lamb. He had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms like it was like a daughter to him. Now, that was a pet in the ancient world. A little lamb was a pet. God, we have pets with dogs and cats. 
They didn't use those as pets. They used sheep, little lambs. A traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. When David heard this, he was incensed over the injustice of this. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And Nathan says to David, you are the man. That destroyed David. He knew exactly what Nathan was talking about. He had committed sin after sin after sin to cover up for his wrongdoing. But God knows absolutely everything that happens in our life. And we do not get away with anything. Now David was not going to die for this. But he's going to be punished. You know, let me use an illustration from football time. Since, praise the Lord, the Chiefs are playing again. <laughs> there are big linemen. And for a runner or a uh, quarterback, they run interference. They knock people down and push people aside so you can run the play and all. Every now and then, the linemen get word about the quarterback that thinks he's hot to trot. And so they just lay down. They just move over and let the people run in and tackle and, uh, the quarterback. And then the quarterback gets a new tongue at that point. He says, I won't say that anymore, guys. I need you. Don't let that happen to me. That's running interference, those men. God runs interference for us. There are so many things that could happen to us that don't happen because God loves His children and runs interference for them. Just like a good parent will find some things in the yard or whatnot that may cut a foot or, or damage a little life and they pick it up and they get rid of it. They're running interference to protect the children they love. God runs interference for us, but if we choose, he didn't have to. Oh, I can handle this on my own. That's what David was saying. See, David committed rape and murder and rebellion against God. And for over nine months, he was rebelling against God. And Nathan comes and says, you're the man. Nevertheless, God says, I'm not going to kill you, but I'm not going to run interference for you. And what happens in his family's life? The next king, Amnon, rapes his half-sister. Absalom murders Amnon. And Absalom plots a great rebellion against David, his father. That's exactly what... David did to God. And once it is all out, and David is faced with his sin, chapter 32 of the Psalms. Blessed is the man, is the one, whose transgressions are forgiven. A transgression is a sin that you deliberately wanted to do and you did it. You knew it was a sin, you did it anyway. That's a transgression. A sin may be something you don't even realize you did. You didn't even realize the wrong you did. Still a sin. But transgressions, for instance, Adam and Eve. Eve sinned, she was deceived. But Adam understood what he was doing and transgressed in taking the fruit. And David said, blessed. That's a plural word. 
It doesn't look like in our translations. But it's many happinesses, many categories of happinesses, personal happinesses, social happinesses, family happinesses, society and national happinesses, and of course spiritual happinesses. To the one whose transgressions are forgiven. Do you realize that in the world of religions, they don't have a means of forgiving your sin? Christianity does, but the others do not. It's always, well, do something good to counteract the bad. That doesn't get rid of our sin. Just because I find somebody that I'm better than doesn't make me any less a sinner. Confessing our sin is the number one problem-solving device that God has given to us in the Christian life. There is no greater problem-solving device than confessing your sin. That's what gets us back in fellowship with God. And we're not going anywhere until that happens. And unfortunately, many people are clueless as to have their sin, how to have their sins forgiven. I've shared with you before an incident that I, when I was at a Christian camp, and I dedicated myself to Christ. And we're all around the pool, and they were doing all kinds of stuff, you know, throwing the, the leader in the pool and different things. And I was standing there behind this young man who I didn't know from Adam, and I pushed him in. <laughs> sort of a mean thing to do. Fully clothed, unexpecting. I felt terrible. You know, the reason I came to Christ, I fully had complete guilt in my life. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I was worthless in God's sight. I had lots of guilt. That's why I came to Christ. And now I'm guilty again. What do I do? I had no clue. I had no clue what to do. So I thought, well, this is how everybody else seemed to work it out. Well, maybe I'll do something nice to cover the bad thing I did. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in his sight. And so I got to know this young man. He was a really interesting young man. He was the son of missionaries who were in some country like Bora Bora. Somewhere in the jungles in the Southeast Asia you know, area. And he talked about some of the most fascinating things that happened in his life. And I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed his company. But I was trying, what was I trying to do? I was trying to work off my sin. And that doesn't do it. Only much later, unfortunately, it took me a long time because it wasn't taught very often. The only way to have your sins wiped away and forgiven is to confess your sin. And God, who judged that sin on the cross, will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So I can get back into fellowship instantly without having to grovel. And many religions, and even in Christianity, you know, they want you to grovel. They want you to have penance, you know. They want you to crawl and gravel uh, so many miles so that you know God will see your contrite and then forgive you. That's nonsense stuff. You confess your sin, and God forgives your sins and cleanses you, and you're ready to go again. That can happen in a second. I say many times in my life, Father, I did that. Father, I sinned. I just tell him. Notice what we have here. Whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed, that's also plural. Many blessednesses. That's difficult to translate Many blessednesses is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them. And in whose spirit is no deceit. You're honest about it. You just you do what you need to do. You confess your sin. Now, going on in verse 3. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. You're in the same position unbeliever is, having guilt and not knowing what to do about it, having the burden of wrongdoing in our life, the burden of having misspoken, having thought wrong, having done wrong, and, and we don't know what to do about it. 
You're in the same position as unbelief with the burden of guilt in their life when we don't confess our sin. And in verse 5, Then I acknowledged my sin to you. That's how you confess. I go in for the... Uh, uh, I'm trucking down the road to Topeka. Uh, my wife drives. This is just an illustration. Down to Topeka, and I got a heavy foot. I'm just daydreaming as usual. And I keep getting faster and faster. And pretty soon there's a guy with lights in his car. Pulls me over and gives me a ticket. Now when I go to court I'm about that ticket, the judge wants me to know if I'm guilty or not guilty. He doesn't want me to know about what I was daydreaming about. He could care less. He doesn't want me to know what my plans were that day or how sorry I am I was speeding. He doesn't want to know any of that. He wants to know one thing. Are you guilty or are you innocent? If I say I'm innocent, then I'll go to court. I'll have a trial. If I say I'm guilty, then he gives me a fine. I'll pay it and move on. That's what acknowledge your sin means. It doesn't mean cry about it. It doesn't mean weep and mourn over it. It means acknowledge it. Admit it. Say to God, yeah, I agree with you. This is a sin. And what does God do when we confess our sin? He forgives our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's a grace means of getting back into fellowship. And that's what He has in mind for us. He doesn't want us groveling. That's not. People want you to grovel. Yeah. Your wife may want you to grovel. Your husband may want you to grovel. You may want your kids to grovel. That isn't God's way. There's no groveling. We confess it, and because Jesus paid for it on the cross, it's forgiven. And David understood that. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my inequity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. And what happened? And you forgave me. That happens every time. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. And so in verse 6 and 7, there's blessings in life when you've had your sins confessed. There's just guilt and the weight of sin in your life when you don't. Therefore let all the faithful pray to you. Let every believer practice praying to God and confessing their sin on a regular basis. That's God's desire for us, to keep in fellowship. If I'm out of sorts with my wife, and it happens frequently, hard to believe, I know. And I have to say, I'm sorry. Now, she may believe me or not, because she has a backlog of my experiences, okay? But I really mean it when I say I'm sorry. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm, I'm going to change my spots. But I am sorry. And that gets me back in fellowship with my wife, which is a good thing. Because if I'm not in fellowship with my wife, my prayers are zero. They don't go as far as the ceiling if I'm not in fellowship with my wife. Therefore, let all believers, all the faithful, pray to you while you may be found. Surely, the rising of the mighty waters will not reach you. That means God is going to protect you in life. You, if you confess your sin, that's not going to make you be destroyed. He's going to protect you in life. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Joy comes when we're forgiven, not when we hide our sin. I will instruct you. Now, beginning in verse 8, verse 8 and 9, God is appealing to us. He's asking for us to do something that benefits our life. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. Do we want to know what God's will for our life, where we should go, what we should do, how we should behave? He'll instruct us once we're in fellowship. If we're out of fellowship, we're no different than an unbeliever who's also out of fellowship. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. The eye of favor. 
the eye of love wanting to do good and benefit for us do not be like I've always loved this passage do not be like the horse or the mule because we can be stubborn can't we David was stubborn for over nine months to not confess his sin by the way confessing our sin only works for a believer go read about Pharaoh and not letting the Israelites go and when the pressure was on he said I and my people have sinned I'll let you go this time which was a lie and God did not accept that confession of his sin as legitimate because he was never a believer do not be like the horse of the mule which have no understanding this passage of scripture helps us to understand that confessing our sin is grace it's easy it's quick it works for us and those who don't understand that grace means that getting back in fellowship are ignorant of God's plan for their life they're as stubborn as a horse or a mule they have to be controlled by bit and bridle or they will not come to you you see the pain we feel the out of fellowship the misery that we have is meant to drive us to God so we'll confess our sin and have it cleansed and be ready to start again many are the woes of the wicked in this world everybody's going to have trouble everybody's going to have a weight of difficulties in their life But the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in Him. To confess your sin on a regular basis is trusting the Lord in that area of your life. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad you're righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. 1 John 1.9, 1 Corinthians 11.31 are both passages that talk about our need to confess our sin that keeps us going down the path we should go thank you father for your word thank you that we can easily get back in fellowship because you are a god of grace in jesus name amen let's share in communion all believers are invited and encouraged to partake you're remembering his sinless life and his perfect sacrifice for us Hymnus number 47. We'll sing all four verses standing on the last. <laughs>
For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and we had given thanks. He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Blessed are the forgiven. That's you and me. We stand before God many times asking for his forgiven. He went to the cross and he paid that unpayable bill that we should have eternity. He has given us that prize. We're truly thankful for his suffering that we might remain. Be with each one of us as we give thought to our shortcomings and our sins that they can be forgiven. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
in the back of your bulletin there is a prayer list are there others we should add I would like to say that KJ had a test last week and it was good KJ Sanders brain tumor was it no, I don't no. know exactly what it is but okay. they were smaller they're smaller now <laughs> okay Kelly Elkins, she's the daughter of my cousin, a uh, young girl in her early 20s. Uh, she's actually my cousin's adopted daughter because she's her niece. Both her parents died of cancer before she was eight, nine years old, and now she has cancer. Uh, she's going through chemo treatments. She's just a very young child, early 20s, and uh, well, I'd like to to ask for prayer for her. You bet. Yeah. Callie, C-A-L-I. Dalton? Delkins. Delton. Okay. E-L-K-I-N-S. Okay. Others? If we don't pray, God won't answer. Our problem? God's solution. And in between, in between these two are our prayer. So, let's pray together. Holy Father, we thank You that You love us, You care for us, You give us a joy in life and a purpose in life. That we don't have to wander around aimlessly in life, but that we can know that You are our guide and You're going to do the best for us. Praise be to Your name. Start off by praying for your own family now, for God's blessing in their life. Your blessing, Father. That's what we're asking for. The eternal blessings from You in their life. May each of them have the assurance that they know Jesus Christ as Savior because they have put their trust in Him. And may the Word of God become a part of their thinking. <coughs> Let us pray for our country. Let us be praying for the three people you're praying for their salvation. Let's take a look at our prayer list and be praying for some of these people.
Oh, that you are the great solver of problems. You can take impossible situations and solve them for us. We are asking on behalf of others and ourselves that you work again your great work. That you would ease the pain of mental anguish. That you enable us to stand for you in your word. That you once again raise up patriot citizens who love you and love the country you've placed them in. Father, of many things that go through our mind, what we're going to face and work tomorrow, the things we'll have to tackle, help us to understand you're going to be there and that we can trust you. That we can go to you at any time for help and that you the great deliverer God will deliver us. Father, continue to help us to be praying. We trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I meant to mention this earlier, but now is a good time as any. Uh, San Salvador, a country in Central America, a very small country really. Uh, they have had for quite a period of time the largest crime per capita of anybody in the Americas, North or South America. The largest crime. And today they have the smallest amount of crime in their country. What magic formula did they find? The magic formula they found was they locked off the criminals. And now, they don't have a crime problem. It's not magic. It's common sense. And God's given us common sense. He didn't put this on our shoulders just to hold a hat. We're supposed to use our brain to the glory of God. Now, I would encourage all of you to use this particular number one technique of the Christian life to confess our sin. Think about it. When I confess my sin, He knows what I'm going to do tomorrow. And it may be the same sin. Maybe the same mental attitude sin. And what's He going to do? I'm going to confess it, and He's going to forgive it every time. That's a gracious God. Let's sing our decision hymn together. Please stand as we sing number 238. memory verse from Psalm 118.8. Psalm 118.8. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. Psalm 118.8. And this week, I will be faithful to my spouse. I will speak the truth in love. I will be courageous and kind. I will be thankful. Let's pray together. Father, all praise and glory to you. You've found a way for us to get back in fellowship with you instantly. You've found a way to take us from darkness to light. We thank you for your great grace plan. Help us to use your grace plan to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>